Okay, g'day all and welcome to another video. So today we're going to be talking about unions. We're going to be talking about C++ and assembly. We're going to be talking about structures. Yeah, so we're going to have a look today at how to define structures in assembly. And we're also going to be uh, looking at exactly what a C++ structure is. Uh, and indeed classes as well. So strap in, I hope it's an interesting video. This is uh, structures in assembly language. Uh, many assemblers include structures functionality or the functionality to combine together smaller data types into single larger data types just for convenience. Uh, okay, so this is how you declare a structure in assembly. We'll have a bit of a look at this stuff in code as we go, but uh, we start out with the structure name such as point just here and then we've got the struct keyword. Uh, this can also be struck without the T on the end for some reason. And then we define the elements of the structure. So right here I've got a point and it's got two elements, X and Y. And they're both DD or define a D word, uh, same as an int in C++. And the question mark just here just means um, don't initialize it to anything. Yeah, so we don't care what it's initialized to. And then at the end of the structure, we close the whole thing off by specifying the structure name again and then end S for end structure. So that's the declaration syntax for a structure. And if we want to actually uh, define a structure, such as uh, my point down here, then we say the name of the instance, which is my point in this case. Then we say the structure name and then we put the um, values for the elements in curly brackets. Oh, okay, so if we come over here into the code, what we're mostly talking about here is the data segment. We'd usually define a data segment structure. So it'll be something like point, and then struct, and then x, dd, question mark, uh, y, dd, question mark, just like that, point, and s, something like that. And then uh, also in the data segment, if we want to define an instance of that, just like we said, my point, and then point, and then the values for each of the elements. Uh, okay, so when you're accessing members of the structure, it's fairly simple. So you've got uh, a couple of options, really. If you've defined a structure in the data segment, like my point, uh, this one just here, then what you would do is you would say something like uh, mov and then my point dot x or dot y, whichever uh, element you want to access. And then you would say something like 100, for example. And that's going to move 100 into the instance, my point. Yeah, good stuff. So if you've got a a pointer in say RCX, maybe you're passed a pointer to the structure uh, from C++, then you would do something like mov and then the pointer would be RCX and then you've got to say the structure type again because uh, assembler doesn't know what RCX is pointing to. So we have to say the structure type again and then the element name and then say 100 if we want to move 100 into whatever RCX is pointing to. Yeah, so note that this, this really means that treat whatever RCX is pointing to as a point. Yeah, the assembler doesn't know for sure that RCX is pointing to a point and uh, you do have to be a little bit careful of that. Yeah, so if RCX is not pointing to a point, then who knows what we're changing. Uh, X just here would mean RCX plus zero and uh, the Y just here would actually mean RCX plus four. Okay, so one of the important things that we have to be aware of is uh, getting C++ and assembly to interact. You know, we don't want to code everything in assembler because it's, uh, it's error prone, it's difficult to debug. Uh, we want to code as much as we can in C++ using the higher level language just because it's easier to, de to debug. Uh, but that does mean that often when we're using structures and we're passing structures between assembly and C++, we really need to know how uh, C++ structures work yeah, in order that we can uh, cooperate between assembly and, uh, and C++. So let's just have a bit of a look at an example just here. I want to point out um, natural alignment. So when you make a structure in C++, it actually aligns the elements uh, to offsets that are divisible by the element size. Uh, so if we have a bit of a look at, it, at an example down here, so this is um, bytes down the bottom just here, and here's my structure just here. So the structure is made up of four elements, a character, an integer, a short integer, and a double. And what I've depicted down the bottom here is the way that C++ will lay this out in RAM. So the character will be at the zeroth offset, or it will be at the start of the structure. But then the integer, because an integer is four bytes wide, the integer will have to be uh, on an address or aligned to an address that's divisible by four. Yeah, so you'll see here that there's three bytes of padding that are added between the character and the integer. Um, just worthless bytes, it's just taking up RAM. Uh, this was for speed purposes back in the day, but uh, a lot of this stuff is kind of irrelevant nowadays and the modern compilers just do it for uh, historical reasons, I guess. Yeah, so the, so the next uh, value, the uh, S just here, the short integer, 
Um, well, the S can fit straight after the uh, integer since um, address 8 is evenly divisible by 2, the size of a short. But the double will actually add quite a bit of padding. So the double here at the end is actually 8 bytes wide. And uh, that means that the offset of this double will have to be evenly divisible by 8. And the next uh, address after this uh, short that's evenly divisible by 8 is actually offset 16. Yeah, so you'll see there's, what's that, 6 little bytes of padding. Okay, so we can actually test this out if we have this uh, structure defined in C. I'll just give that a bit of a say for a second. What we can say here, we can do something like STD uh, C out size is and then uh, size of my struct. And what we should see is a size of 24 bytes, even though the actual elements is nowhere near 24 bytes. Let's have a bit of a run and see what we get. Yeah, there you go. The size is 24 bytes. Yeah, so the actual size there of the data is what? 4 plus 1 is 5, plus 2 is 7, plus 8 is uh, 15. Yeah, so we could actually fit this entire structure in 15 bytes, but C++ has used uh, natural alignment. Really worth knowing uh, if you're defining structures that are made up of uh, interleaved, smaller and larger elements. So if you have something like um, char uh, A like that, and then a uh, double B like that, and then char C like that, and then double... Uh, D like that. Uh, this structure just here that's alternating between characters and doubles, this is actually going to take up quite a bit of space in RAM because each of these characters will be padded uh, enough such that this uh, following double here can fit on an address of 8 bytes. Uh, meaning that this character here will actually take up or will consume, along with its padding, something like 8 bytes. So we'd be looking at um, 32 bytes here for the entire structure. Let's have a bit of a run. Yeah, there you go, 32 bytes. So this is really worth being aware of, and uh, you really need to know this if you're going to get C++ structures to interact with assembly. Okay, so we have a couple of options in assembly. For one thing, we can uh, just leave the C++ structure as it is, and pad our assembler structure. So this right here is exactly the same structure as C++. Uh, my struct, struct, and then we've got uh, the C, which is DB, or define a byte, and then we've got three bytes of padding, uh, this dup just here, or 3 dup 0, means duplicate 0 uh, for 3 characters. Then we've got our integer after that, then we've got our short, and then we've got our 6 bytes of padding, as we see down the bottom here, this is just what C++ does. And uh, then finally at the end we define our real 8, or our double. So you can make exactly the same thing in assembler as C++ if you know how C++ pads. So we've just seen how we can get assembly to cooperate with a C++ structure, the other option that we could use is, uh, is to pragma pack our C++ structure. So if you pragma pack your C++ structure and you provide one just here, then that means uh, align your data to addresses divisible by one. In other words, any address. Yeah, so that means just pack the data in uh, as tightly as possible. Or in other words, pack it exactly the same way that assembler would pack it. Uh, this is what you'll end up with down here. So your character will take up one byte and your integer will follow that with no padding at all. Then your short will follow that, and then your double will follow that. So our total structure here would be 15 bytes if we took the size of. So this, if we just copy this. Uh, if we just copy this over to C++ and we give it a bit of a run, we should see that the size of my struct is now 15 bytes. There you go. So there's no extra padding added. Uh, and the equivalent of that C++ uh, structure in assembler is the same thing as we had before, except without the padding. Yeah, so by default, uh, assembler will do um, normal padding. It won't add any extra padding. Yeah, so that, that uh, structure just there in assembler is the same as uh, this one with pragma pack in C++. Classes in C++ are actually the same as, uh, pretty much anyway, pretty much the same as uh, structures. Yeah, so the, uh, the methods in a class, interestingly enough, don't actually take up any RAM. Well, they don't take up RAM within the uh, class anyway. So to match uh, a C++ class, what you would define in assembler is a structure with the same data elements. Yeah, and it's interesting too that uh, assembler doesn't care about C++'s private. It couldn't care less. <laughs> yeah, so if you define a class in C++, even if it's got private members, and you pass that to assembly, which has a structure that's defined in the same way, then uh, you can access the uh, private members or the protected members of the class from assembly with, uh, with no trouble at all. Okay, so let's just have a bit of a look at that actually, because that might be interesting. So if we've got something like class, my class, uh, something like that, and we say private, and we go int i, 
and we go public and int get i. Um, okay, so I've just defined a simple little class here with uh, a single private member, int i. So if we wanted to define the same thing in uh, assembler, all we would say is, uh, what did I call it? My class. Okay, we would just say something like um, my class struct. And then we would say um, i, dd, and question mark. My class and s. Yeah, so that is the equivalent thing in uh, assembler. No, there's no private, there's no protected. Assembler couldn't care less. <laughs> All right, so let's have a go at making one of these things and changing the private member from our uh, public function. So we would say something like, um, is it my class uh, m, just like that. And then we'll define a little function. Something like that. A forward reference my class. And then some function m. Um, okay, so all I've done here is just called this function and passed to m as a uh, as a parameter. And so from uh, assembler, what we should be able to do is uh, mov rcx, and that's a pointer to my class dot i a hundred. Um, okay, so I. My class .i from C++ is private, but from assembler, it, you know, it doesn't care. Well done, I didn't print anything out. So we can all just imagine the correct, yes, let's, um, let's use our very amazing code skills and say uh, something like value uh, m.geti. Let's just put a less than symbol and a comma in there. Keep ourselves on our toes, shall we? All right, let's hit play and see what happens. And there you go. So assembly doesn't care at all uh, that this is private. It's, it's just not private to assembly. It's completely public like everything else in RAM. And the other thing that's important about this little demonstration here is that classes in C++ are actually structures in assembly. Yeah, so, so most of object-oriented programming is really just little tricks by the uh, compiler. Uh, a lot of it is just abstraction and uh, from assembly, you know, it doesn't really care about that sort of stuff. Okay, moving on. So we can supply default arguments to our structures, something like that. Uh, if we've got a structure called point and instead of a question mark, we specify values after it, say 100, just like this, then those are called the default arguments. And if we define point just here, point one, and then we say the structure name, and then we supply empty braces, uh, empty curly braces, then that means use the default values. So point one dot x would be 100, point one dot y would be 100. And the second example down here, I've supplied a, an argument for the y value or the second value, but I haven't for the x value. Yeah, so I've just put a comma there for the x value. And what that means is use the default argument or 100 for the x value and the second value uh, or the y should be set to 99. Uh, or if you want to override both of the default arguments, then you can specify two parameters just there like that. Um, okay, so moving on to unions. So unions are very similar to structures, except that all of the data takes up the same space or has the same address or reusing the same uh, RAM for multiple different data types. So this is a union in C++. We've got a character, a short, an int, and a long, long, huge. And that union in C++ will actually only take up uh, eight bytes. And all of these values, uh, small, medium, large, and huge, will actually have the same address. Yeah, so if we write to one of them, say small, uh, it's actually gonna change all of the values. Uh, a union in assembler is much the same. The name of the union, my union in this instance, then we've got um, uh, then we've got the union keyword, then our data types. So small, medium, large, and huge. Uh, then we name our data. So we've got uh, small, medium, large, and huge. And then we've, got, then we've got the data types, DB, DW, DD, and DQ. Uh, something you do have to be careful of with unions is a little syntax error. It's um, still end S at the end of a union, not end U, yeah, end S. Okay, so this is my union over here, the same as on the previous slide, I think. And uh, over here, we've got another little code block where I was trying to demonstrate something. Oh, if anyone can tell me what's interesting about this number, leave a comment below. A little puzzle for you all. What's interesting about that number? Anyway, uh, what I wanted to say was um, if you specify uh, an initial value for your union, it will actually only set the first uh, element. Yeah, so right here, I've got this um, PP, my union. So PP is the uh, instance name. 
And then my union is the name of the union. And then I'm trying to specify an integer or an unsigned int just here uh, by the look of the hex. Uh, but it won't actually set the integer. All that it's going to do is read the um, little byte down here because that's the first uh, element inside my union. Um, accessing members of unions is exactly the same as uh, structures, except that uh, all of these elements do take up the same space. Uh, okay, so here we've got a very similar example to what we we're just looking at in the slide. Uh, I've got my union defined at the top and it's got its four little elements just here. And this is the line here that we were talking about in the code. So this is actually not going to set uh, what it might seem. So if we hit a bit of a run and see exactly what PP is set to. Okay, so PP is the name of the union instance. Uh, what you can see is that small is indeed set to FF or that. It's uh, 255 in hex. Oh, 255 in decimal, sorry. But medium is also set to 255, as is large and as is huge. So uh, the assembler didn't actually set uh, the elements to this. Uh, it just set the first element to whatever fits in that element. So that's uh, one byte or 255. Uh, okay, so accessing elements of a union is pretty much the same as uh, accessing uh, elements of a structure. And the only thing that you've really got to be aware of is if you change the value of a union, any of the elements, then you're probably going to update the others too. So right here, I've set the large element, but because a union uh, overlaps or all of the elements overlap in RAM, uh, what we'll see is that all of the values have actually updated. Yeah, so then small is not 255 anymore, it's 41, yeah, or the lowest byte of um, that number, just there. Uh, medium was updated, large and huge were updated as well. Yeah, so that's unions. Uh, you can also have nested structures if you want. Yeah, so this actually doesn't work the same as it used to. Um, it's very difficult to find uh, good information on uh, modern MASM, the macro assembler. Uh, there is a document uh, for MASM 6.1 that came out in about, I think, 97. And uh, that's floating around online and that's worth a read. But it does show that uh, some of these things, like uh, particularly the flexibility in the nested structures mechanisms, uh, these have changed and we can no longer do a bunch of things that we used to be able to do. Um, you can nest structures if you want, something like this. So I've got here a, a point structure, so just point struct and then X and Y. And then I've got line struct and line struct is made up of a start point and a finish point. And you can specify default parameters in there for each individual nested structure if you want. And the way that you completely define the um, default values for these nested structures is something like this. Um, you just nest your curly braces. Uh, the other thing that I want to point out is if you want to break your uh, definition into a couple of lines, then you might need to use the slash just there. Yeah, whenever there's a new line. Okay, so that's just about all that I wanted to say. So if you'd like to support the channel and uh, what I'm doing here, you could head over to Patreon and become a patron of the channel. Uh, or you could have it head over to Facebook and say hello. Um, it's a bit of a strange time right now with this uh, horrible virus going around in the world. Um, I just want to say uh, I hope you all stay healthy and uh, thank you very much for watching all. Have a good one.